Hello, welcome to the Digital Gaming Lecture for January 1st. Posting this uh, on Saturday uh, before New Year's Eve so that hopefully you can get this thing uh, knocked out some point on, uh, on today on Saturday or New Year's Eve day so you can enjoy New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Then we'll be back at it with the next couple of lectures, uh, January 2nd. Uh, Tuesday and January 3rd. Wednesday we'll have sort of regular days with lectures and quizzes um, <clears throat> and recorded lectures like this one. Um, hello, welcome back. Um, what we got going on today is uh, what in a regular textbook might be about 8 to 10 pages. Um, we're going to cover several topics uh, related to digital gaming. Hopefully you've had a chance to read the chapter uh, and to check out the um, to check out the lecture slides. You're able to follow along on your own. Um, normally when I show this, uh, normally when I cover this, this topic about digital gaming, I show this film called, um, uh, Indie Game the Movie. I am determined to make video games, and I make video games because I can. I mean, it's the sum total of every expressive medium of all times. All right, so it's a little bit of an overstatement that video games can be the sum total of all expression, basically, but... What the film is about is about these small, like, one- or two-person teams that make video games. And it's meant to teach you that people can actually do that now. You can tell a story, you can take a very personal story, and express it through uh, the development of a video game. And so these are obviously indie gamers who develop relatively small games. Um, in most cases, they're platformers. In this context, platformer means a game where a little guy runs, a, little guy runs across a platform, like, Mar like Super Mario Brothers. Um... Uh, or in that case, there, there was Fez. There, there are other games. Uh, uh, Super Meat Boy is uh, is <laughs> reference to Super Mario Brothers SMB, right? Um, anyway, if you're familiar with any of these independent games, they're they're pretty fun. They're pretty cheap, and you know, literally a couple of people can make them. It might take them a year, but they can produce them. Made interactive. Like, how is that not? It's awesome. My whole career has been me trying to find new ways to communicate with people because I desperately want to communicate with people, but I don't want the messy interaction of having to make friends and talk to people because I probably don't like them. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's a little insight into the type of person that's uh, depicted in the indie game uh, world. But yeah, these guys are coders first and narrative designers second. But if you, if you take anything away from this lecture, uh, it's that uh, you know indie game is a pretty cool film. Yeah, but the point of that is... Um, narratives can be produced not only in novels, not only in television shows, not only in film, classic film, or new, you know, pop culture film. There are narratives in video games, and there's a lot more to it uh, than just a little guy running across the screen. All right, so that's a little bit of a uh, prelude to this presentation. Um, I start with all your base are belong to us. It has, like, a weird personal meaning to me. Like, people used to, like, uh, graffiti that around campus when I was in college. It was one of the first like national uh, digital memes that got passed around in email. Yep, people used to do that before there was a YouTube. People would email each other memes. They were sort of few and far between. You could have a meme that lasted like, I don't know, like four or five months instead of four or five minutes. Uh, but that was that was one, and it's a video. The link is in the in the uh, chapter if you actually want to watch it. It's just a silly short video that has a bunch of photoshopped images, but it references late '80s, early 1990s video games. It's based on a, a Sega port of a uh, arcade game, and the only reason I put it in there is is to say that people get nostalgic for games. That games are entering the culture in a way where they matter. Right, so the cu the culture and social context of video games and game narratives is what this is about. All right, digital gaming. Video games are now an essential part of culture. That's all I'm saying. Video games can take old culture and re, uh, recreate them for us, and they're also new cultural products uh, that you may one day be nostalgic about. More than ships shooting aliens, which is actually what uh, Zero Wing, the game All Your Base, uh, the All Your Base meme comes from, uh, is this game Zero Wing, where you're just uh, you're just this little spaceship dude like flying across the screen, like you know, pew pew, like shooting all these bad aliens that would fly by, and there were like a million games like that in the 80s and 90s, right? Um, you know, more than that now, you have uh, incredibly immersive games, um, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto, uh, in newer Halo films, Call of Duty, uh, newer Halo, sorry, games, not films, um, Call of Duty. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the various sort of levels of immersion that you can have with video games, and also talk very briefly about controversy about uh, video game effects. Um, 
I'll, I'll go ahead and offer a spoiler alert. Um, there's no evidence that video games, quote unquote, make people violent. But there's also this, these sort of theories about the ag in the aggregate of all culture, uh, films, uh, digital gaming, and and TV shows, if they if they might be having a negative effect on us or making us a more violent culture um, on the whole. Okay. So here's how video games constitute narratives. They set scenes. Some of the most important work done in video gaming is scene design. Um, video game developers will spend a lot of time making their worlds seem as realistic as possible, as immersive as possible. Uh, one of the games that immediately comes to mind is uh, Zelda on, on Nintendo Switch, The Legend of Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild. Um, things like games like this just are insane at their ability to make worlds and make them seem realistic. I think I should shut up and let you watch this. So I'm watching this and I'm noticing like, that looks like the island from Star Wars La uh, Last Jedi, and that looks like the little ice fox from Star Wars Last Jedi. So maybe there's some uh, some influence between cultural products going on here. But it, look, if you grew up on uh, Super Mario Brothers, and you're watching, uh, you know, this latest Zelda game come out, like you have to appreciate <laughs> how far we've come. Like I I grew up like this came out when I was um, six years old, six or seven years old. Uh, it would have been in in, uh, uh, in Japan about a year earlier, so yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I was I was six years old when uh, I got my first Nintendo, and to go from this in my lifetime to this has been a cultural phenomenon. I mean, people can live inside of these games, and you know, some people do. <laughs> if you think about South Park. Uh, the Warcraft episode, <laughs> that's a pretty good indication that, um, you know, there's this other aspect of video gaming that leaves people pretty messed up if they get too involved with <laughs> it. There's the image I was looking for. Um, the way we depict ourselves in digital realities versus uh, what happens to people when they spend too much time <laughs> gaming. I'm sorry, I'm being very juvenile here. But, uh, no, it's not always particularly healthy. So if we come back to the PowerPoint, where, where, where do we start this tangent? We started by talking about video games as narratives, creating immersive worlds. Sometimes they're too immersive. They can lead to, you know, they can influence, be one of many influences on Americans uh, or people around the world leading a sedentary lifestyle. Um, there's a whole issue with, you know, guys getting uh, addicted to online games and not, like, finding girlfriends and getting married uh, in... I think it's in China more so than in Japan, but in, in some, you know, Asian countries, like, parents will actually, like, kick their kids off of games or, like, threaten them, like, with losing, you know, their, their, their housing and their inheritance if they don't get off of games because they're not getting married and having kids, right? So there are definitely cultural influences uh, related to video games, uh, and part of it is because the narratives are so gripping. The scenes are set. They're very immersive. They're very engaging. The, the scenery tells a story like I just showed you with uh, uh, the, the Zelda game, uh, Breath of the Wild, uh, and the controls tell a story. The way that you move through a game tells you what your capabilities are. It gives you parameters for how much is expected of you and how much you can do inside of this world. Ultimately, all of the elements of other mass media products are there in video game narratives. You know, there's, there's setting, there's characters, uh, there's a plot, there are plot twists, there are plot devices, you know, there are, there are good plots and very depth, in depth and detailed ones, and then there are cheesy ones that are like, you know, why does this need to exist? Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's rising action and, and uh, conflict, uh, climax and resolution in a lot of video game narratives. Um, they follow the same formula, oftentimes, at least like the main route through a game. Um, uh, will follow the narrative of, of a film or of a book. Video game platforms are uh, even more immersive uh, and become platforms for cultural creation 
and they can they are often cases uh, global, like really global. And so yeah, there are there are console games that also have online. Uh, connectivity capabilities like you can do Call of Duty. You can join, you know, uh, a squad and you can go, you know, fight with, with, with friends or with people you meet online. Um, there's also uh, fully immersive uh, MMORPGs. Um, the uh, I always want to make sure I say it right. Massively multiplayer online role-playing games uh, like World of Warcraft. The that um create whole worlds for people to live in. And Minecraft is another one uh, that obviously immediately comes to mind. These are games played globally where um, they create an environment and inside of that... Oh, Mom. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> they, they create environments where you can actually become creators yourselves within the world. So somebody creates a video game and then you go play it and then you realize there's so many tools here, there's so much capability, um, I can actually add to the narrative. I can actually make my own story. Uh, in, in the chapter I show, uh, I, I have a link to some of the most amazing creations that people have made um, on with, uh, in Minecraft, right? So takeaways here are that uh, video game platforms are completely immersive in ways that can be both good and bad. You can, you can be um, your own creator within these worlds. Um, but on the other hand, there are potential uh, negative influences on sedentary lifestyle and on people completely neglecting other aspects of culture to play these games. I don't know why I keep laughing. It's it's not that funny, and I, I think I should, like, just, you know, true confessions. Like, my son is five years old. You've probably seen Sammy in chats. And, like, we do almost daily between when I drop his mom off to work and when I take him uh, to, to grab the bus for school, like, like we do this, like we do Pokemon Go. Like I'm one of these people who still, um, actually participates in this, um, you know, game platform that is an augmented reality game that is plastered on top of like, you know, actual reality. So, you know, this is augmented reality. Um, you can turn off the automatic animation feature and actually see it in your own, you know, living room or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, there I just cut the the deli bird first one of today. Um, so yeah, games are are can be addicting. They can be attractive and ultimately very immersive. So the takeaway quote: I'm gonna get to a point where we can actually stop and give you something a little more concrete. When a game is built to be its own creative digital platform, it becomes a space where much of the creative work falls to the user, as both opportunity and responsibility. So yeah, I'm getting a little bit um, Spider-Man here, but with you know, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. So when you're, oh, what, why did that need to be on here? What, <laughs> when um, when you give people tools, they can make amazing things. If I go over to the chapter, uh, I can show you. Um, I wonder if my chapter's up here. Nah. If I go over, no, you don't need to see that. Sorry. Just leave it open in case I need it. But you go to the chapter and you, you look at, um, you know, how, how these uh, platforms are built and what kind of capabilities they create. I, I think we've talked about it uh, enough, but um, what, you can, what you can see from this quote is... Um, People are not just creating narratives in and of themselves; they're creating the opportunity for narrative. All right, All right. Some related theories: um, cultivation theory, social learning theory. Um, there's there's a, an important differentiation to make between saying that uh, mass media cause changes in society, uh, which we really try to be careful not to say, and saying that they influence culture and influence ultimately society. And so you talk to, you know, people who study the limited effects paradigm, they're going to say, that, you know, mass media don't cause things to happen in society, but they do uh, influence people um, much the same way that, uh, you know, the church or their family or their neighborhood or their friends would influence them. So these are two different theories. Cultivation theory comes from George Gerbner and social learning theory comes from Albert Bandura. And these are both trying to get at the potential for broad social impact or the long-term impact. 
Cultivation theory is more about long-term impact of television and now video games and the idea that if you're consistently exposed to a lot of violent television or a lot of violent video games there's there's a chance this will become an influence on not just the individual but on society it'll influence culture and influence society and basically the the underlying assumption is that you reap what you sow and, and what they're attempting to do is to uh, explain in theoretical terms with evidence uh, what is sort of a truism in culture for a long time that you know um, if, if you uh, if certain behaviors just become habit for individuals and they become habit for large groups and ultimately they may they may have broad social effects the problem is you can't look at um, surveys or mass or, or video game experiments and see um, these mass media effects you can see maybe little pieces of effect or you can see like mood changes but this idea that people are going to consume video games and then um, the idea that people are going to consume video games and have their behavior change is just not likely, right? Um, there can be short-term mood effects, but what, what these scholars are trying to get at is um, the sort of aggregate evolution of culture over time, which is really hard to measure and very hard to prove. So the best they can do is say it is, is very likely that we, we reap what we sow and that the cultivation over a long period of time can have uh, cultural influences. So if you, can, if you get any takeaway from this, cultivation theory is Gerbner uh, looking at um, sort of social evolution and how it might be influenced or shaped by violence among other aspects of mass media uh, and he was worried about TV but scholars also apply it to video games right it's not gonna show up very well in a short-term experiment but that doesn't mean there aren't uh, potential sort of evolutionary effects or social evolutionary effects in the aggregate social learning theory Bandura is the monkey see monkey do concept right this this uh, these are like little film clips that come from research films watching kids who watch violent behavior on TV and then they do violent things uh, in their playtime immediately afterwards. The issue about social learning theory in the uh, experimental environment is like the effects wear off. Like the kid might be violent for 15 minutes after watching some, you know, cartoon or something like that, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean it sticks with the kid for life. Um, the concern with social learning theory is rel is related to the concern for cultivation, and that's if you if you keep doing it over time, people might internalize this behavior. But there's really not evidence that video games make people violent. Um, there are a lot of other psychological and cultural factors. So ultimately, we're talking about influences, not causes. And finally, I want to leave you with the gamified environment uh, and the continuation of the concept of all your base are belong to us. So. Um, the chapter starts with this, you know, cultural reference to this, the, you know, the first big memes, you know, pre-YouTube video memes. Uh, all your base are belong to us. It's this silly video. And it just, I mean, it's just, it's just silly. Locked up. Someone set up us to bond. We get signal. Locked. Main screen turn on. It's you. How are you, gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. What you say? You have no chance to survive make your time. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so there you go. Like it's just kind of cheesy and silly, right? And the actual the actual video game uh, is like I said, just a spaceship flying through and shooting things up. Um, the all your base video turns into like a weird techno trip. What would happen if these aliens actually did influence our culture? All your base, your base, base, base. All your base. All right, their names would be everywhere. The, the term would be everywhere. All right, so kind of stupid, but at the same time, um, we actually can see uh, <laughs> not just in augmented reality games or in um, uh, MMORPGs, uh, we can see, you know, uh, the possibility for massive influences for video games on our culture. So more and more of life is becoming a game or like a game. Um, college admissions. I were I was um, a uh, committee member on a thesis where this uh, this young woman studied how 
they're gamifying the college admissions process to try to keep uh, potential students engaged and interested. They make a game out of touring the campus and getting your passport stamped and earning certain credits or whatever for prizes, right? They're gamifying food purchases. In some ways, this has been going on for a long time. You know, they, they, there has been this sort of collecting stamps aspect in the grocery store for 50 years, um, but now it's getting your card punched. So every, you know, 10th or 12th coffee, you get a free one. Kohl's will give you cash that's only good at Kohl's to make you feel like you're really saving a lot of money because you spend a lot of money, but they give you cash back immediately that you're going to go and then spend, you know, next time you're going to have $20 towards whatever purchase that you make. Uh, and it's all encouraged, uh, encouraging you to keep coming back and to create sort of um, uh, addiction-like responses in people, right? You could call it habit or you could call it addiction. Not every habit rises to the level um, of addiction. It's not all that bad, but um, there, there certainly are elements of addiction for people who, uh, who can carry smartphones around with them and engage with, you know, gamified environments around, around the world um, or who just, you know, develop it gives them a reason to develop an addiction where they're already maybe had a propensity for it in terms of shopping or eating or drinking coffee or whatever, right? Um, and so so I've, I've talked about Pokemon Go, but there are other augmented reality games like Ingress, uh, and they're coming out with a Harry Potter game relatively soon, um, such that um, you, know, you, you really could see um, continued influence of video games over society. And it's one of the best examples of... Um, convergence on a single platform of all of, of all different types of, of media possibly there, there there's video there's obviously acting that gets incorporated into digital gaming now um, there there's still sometimes still photos obviously a lot of music and music elements um, and if you want to in the in the chat in the chapter um, there's a link to um, um, a uh, oh an 8-bit audio builder uh, it's going to take me a second to get over here. But in the digital gaming chapter, you can see my back end here. I hope that's fun. Um, there's a link that, that kind of cracks me up. You can go and build your own um, digital music section. Um, let's see if it's there, 8 bit. Yeah, you can make your own chiptune music with this thing, Beatbox. And it's going to start sounding like. Nintendo or Atari, but if you play around with it, you can build music in just a second. And here's the percussion. So why would you do that? I don't know, just because it's fun. You can tweet out the link uh, after you create it. Uh, at least you used to be able to. Uh, I don't know, record a little video of it? I don't care. Send me, send me in some way uh, evidence that you, uh, that you made your own. Uh, uh, you made your own um, beatbox or 8-bit tune. Oh, nice, I saved it. Um, and I'll give you... Um, uh, 20 extra credit points on the final exam, which is a 500 point test, so it's not nothing. Um, look, I hope this has been interesting. I went around kind of all over the place, but the takeaways are kind of obvious, I think. Um, video games are, you know, they tell narratives much the same as other, um, you know, cultural products like uh, books and movies and TV shows. Um, those narratives involve setting a scene, setting a scene, controlling the story, and you know, like incorporating all those other elements. Um, video game platforms are now really, really global, like with MMORPGs, massively multiplayer online role-playing games. Uh, anytime I give you a massive takeaway quote, you got to know that one. Um, video games create platforms in which other people, the user, can actually become a creator, which I think is awesome, right? So, yeah, something about broad definition of video games, video games as narrative, video games as global and immersive, and video games as creating platforms for uh, users to make their own stuff. And then, you know, these these theories are important, definitely the type of thing that would show up on the final. Uh, but for the quiz, um, 
it's important to know these are influences, not causes. You cannot say one game has caused somebody to become a mass murderer. But on the other hand, uh, you know, when we when we make meaning, we tell ourselves stories about ourselves and our society. Um, and there's definitely reason to think that if we see ourselves as a violent culture, uh, we will enact that um, to a larger degree in, uh, over time. Doesn't mean that it forces this upon us, but um, if, if we see our, our ourselves as part of a culture and see the culture uh, as violent or as growing more violent, uh, it can um, open up uh, avenues for us to basically feel like this is a normal thing. It creates uh, new norms, and where where new norms are created. Um, uh, new behaviors can follow. All right. So thanks for paying attention to this one. It's been a pretty long lecture. Hopefully it's been enjoyable. And what's left? Um, what's left is uh, the last couple of days of lectures and quizzes, and then the final exam review on Thursday, and the final exam on Friday, January 5th. Have a uh, happy new year, and uh, we will... I'll see you guys on January 2nd.